this chapter we're going to start talking about animal diversity. There are many characteristics that group animals together and separate them from the other groups of organisms that we've seen so far. For example, all animals are multicellular, all animals reproduce sexually, all animals are deployed throughout the entire life so they don't have this haplodiplontic cycle as plants had. They're also capable of movement, although this is not true for all animals. The majority are capable of movement or at least can move at a certain time in their life. Uh, so let's look at sexual reproduction. So when we talked about plants and algae and other protists, we saw how they can have this alternation of generations where they can have organisms, multicellular organisms that are haploid and multicellular organisms that are diploid. This does not uh, happen in animals. So in animals, they are always diploid and the only time that they are haploid is the gametes, which are just a single cell, the sperm and the ovu, and those cells do not reproduce and the only function that they have is to carry genetic information until fertilization and the formation of the cycle. Once the cycle forms, which is now diploid, the combination of the mother and the father's genes, that cycle can then reproduce and form an organism. There is no alternation of generation in animals. Another key innovation in the evolution of animals was the appearance of symmetry. So if you look at a plant or a protist or algae, they don't really have a specific symmetry. But in animals, we're going to see that there are two types of symmetry mainly. Another thing is the more complexity of tissues, organization of cells into tissues with separate functions. We also have the formation of a body cavity in some animals, which is very important for increasing in size. And uh, a very organized embryonic development that determines the diversity of animals. Another key innovation was the appearance of segmentation. So the repetition of identical structures that allows animals to grow larger without having to create new structures or invent new structures. So let's look at symmetry. The first animals are the least complex of all the animals are sponges and they lack any symmetry. So if you see the sponge, there's really no way you can divide it and have two mirror image of itself. It's just there's no real symmetry. But when we move to the next group of animals, for example, cnidarians like this anemone or jellyfish and also corals, they have radial symmetry. What this means is you can divide the animal in any plane that goes across the center and you will have two mirror images. So here you can see these black lines. You can divide it in infinite number of lines and you will have identical halves that are the mirror image of each other. And these animals that have radial symmetry, like these cnidarians, usually are sessile, which means they don't move. Or if they do move, like jellyfishes, they do move, but they don't move very fast and they don't have a clear direction of movement. So in their case, it's good to have radial symmetry because you can encounter prey from any side. If you don't move, your prey can come from any angle. Or you can have predators or have threats from any angle as well. So there is no clear direction where things will come to you. So the radial symmetry is good for animals that don't move very fast. But some animals, so starting with flatworms, for example, there was the invention of bilateral symmetry. symmetry. Now, when I say invention, I don't really mean like these animals came up with this idea, but through mutations they developed to have this bilateral symmetry and this provide enough advantages that it was eventually selected forward. So these animals have bilateral symmetry. What it means to have bilateral symmetry is that there is only one way in which you can divide the animal and have two mirror images. And that's alongside with the animal if you divide it into left and right. Left and right will be mirror image of each other. And this was very important because once you have this bilateral symmetry, you have a clear front and a clear rear. So you have an anterior part, which is the head, you could say, and a posterior part, which is the tail. And this direction is great for movement. So now once you have a direction for movement, you have a place where you're going to encounter things. So you're more likely to run into things on the head. So if you're going to run into prey, more likely your head is going to encounter it first than your tail. The same thing with a predator. If you're moving, it's more likely you find it forward than on the back. So this place gives a 
strategic location to place in sensory organs. If you want to see your prey, you're going to put your eyes towards the front, which is the place that's going to encounter them first. If you're going to have a nose, then your olfactory organs will have to be, or receptors will have to be towards the front, which is also the first part that is likely to encounter any scent from your prey or your predators. So this means that most of the senses will be located towards the head. And once you have all the sensory organs in the head, now you're going to need a nervous system or a nervous tissue to interpret the information that those senses are getting. So this means having this bilateral symmetry that allows for movement, that gives an orientation, and a placement for the sensory organs is also promoting the formation of a brain. And this is called cephalization. So once you have a place where all your sensory organs are placed, now you're going to need the nervous tissue to process that information and that has to be as close to those senses as possible. So although flatworms are the first ones to have bilateral symmetry do not really have a fully developed brain, they are at the beginning of the process of cephalization. So bilateral symmetry allowed animals to move and the movement led to having the sensory organs placed at the front and that eventually led to having a brain towards the front. The next point is the formation of tissues. So animals have a, quite a diversity of tissues and this all starts since embryonic development. So at embryonic development, the first thing that happens, or one of the first things that happen once you have a certain number of cells, is that they start dividing into three germ layers. Now these three germ layers are present in the most advanced group of animals. From flatworms on, you're going to have three layers of tissues. The basal animals like sponges, they only have one germ layer, and cnidarians, they have two germ layers. But then from flatworms on, we're going to have three germ layers. And those layers are the most, the innermost, which is called the endoderm, so endo from inside, and derm from layer, or skin layer, cell layer. This endoderm, the innermost, gives rise to the digestive cavity, the digestive tract. Then you have the outermost, which is called ectoderm, ecto from exterior, ectoderm. And this is, ectoderm gives rise to the skin and also the nervous system and endocrine glands. And the tissue in the middle between the endoderm and the ectoderm is the mesoderm, so meso for in between. The mesoderm will give rise to tissues like muscle, bones, circulatory system, respiratory system. This is also very important in germ layer because not only gives rise to important tissues, but in most advanced animals, it has a cavity inside, which brings us to the next point, the body cavity. And uh, you can see here, for example, that there are two cavities. There is the inside cavity inside the endoderm, which is the digestive cavity. So that's only for the digestive tract. That's where food is going to go through from the mouth to the anus. And then those cavities in the middle, which are those right here that are inside the mesoderm. So if you see the mesoderm is this yellow tissue and these cavities are all surrounded by mesoderm tissue. That's called the coelom. And the coelom is very important because this cavity allows for circulation of minerals and nutrients within the body of the animal. So the animal can grow larger as it can now circulate nutrients and oxygen throughout its body. It also allows it to hold larger organs. For example, in our case, for example, our lungs are also inside the mesoderm cavity. So uh, this cavity allows the formation of organs and also the circulation of nutrients and oxygen and other gases through the body. So this body cavity, here is spelled the coelom, something that appears later on and is found in the most advanced organisms. Some organisms have a pseudocelum and some lack a coelom entirely. So the most basal group of organisms like flatworms, they don't have a coelom and they're called acelomate because they don't have a cavity and this limits the size that they can grow so they don't have that space for exchange of nutrients and movement of gases so they have to be small enough that things can diffuse through the cells in the body so all the nutrients will have to diffuse from the digestive tract through all the cells and likewise, oxygen will have to be fused from the outside environment through all the cells in the body. That's also why they're flat. They're so flat because they, they depend mainly on diffusion to move things in and out of their body. 
Some animals have what is called a pseudocelom. So this is not a real coelom because it's not surrounded by mesoderm tissue. Instead, the pseudocelom forms in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. But still it does the trick, so it, it gives them some space. They can use that pseudocelom to move nutrients and distribute oxygen and CO2 through their bodies. Roundworms have this ability to grow a little bit larger. And then we have the true coelom, and animals that have a true coelom are called coelomates. So for example, annelids have a true coelom. Us, chordates, we are coelomates, we have a true coelom form inside the mesoderm tissue, surrounded by mesoderm tissue. Another step in the evolution of animals was the, the evolution of embryonic development. And embryonic development allows animals to be so diverse. So just a small change during embryonic development can have a large impact in the organism as an adult. And there are two types of embryonic development. One is the one used by protostomes, and the other one is one used by deuterostomes. So these two animals that share the same embryonic development, they are closely related. So we can use embryonic development as a phylogenetic trait. One of the differences between protostomes and deuterostomes is that when the first set of cells divide, the next set of cells is not right on top of the original cells, but is slightly rotated, and that is called spiral cleavage. In deuterostomes, when the cells divide, the new cells are right on top of the original cells. So this is called radial cleavage. The other difference is that in protostomes, the cells are determined very early on. What it means by determined, if you remember from bio 1, is that the cells are already committed to a path. So for example here, you have an embryo with four cells and those cells are already committed to specific organs and specific parts of the body. If you take one of those cells out of the embryo, the embryo cannot develop those body parts. And therefore, the embryo cannot develop at all and it will just stop dividing. On the other hand, deuterostomes have indeterminate development. So that means the cells do not become determined until much later on in development. So that means that if you take a cell apart from a deuterostome, this early stage, they can still divide. And in as a matter of fact, each piece that you get is going to develop into a normal embryo. This is how identical twins are formed. The other difference is the fate of the blastopore. So the blastopore, during the development of the embryo, the mass of cells starts to invaginate or fold inwards. And as they fall inwards, the pore that remains is called a blastopore. In protostomes, that hole will become the mouth. And in deuterostomes, the blastopore becomes the anus and then the mouth develops later on. Another difference is also how the mesoderm forms. Protostomes, the mesoderm starts developing from cells that get trapped in between the endoderm and the ectoderm, and that starts growing and expanding and forming a coelom. While in deuterostomes, part of this infolding starts growing like little Mickey Mouse ears, you can see, and those pouches that form then pinch off and form the mesoderm. Both coeloms are form of mesoderm, so both protostomes and deuterostomes have true coeloms. And then the next innovation in in animals was the appearance of segmentation. And segmentation actually appear multiple times independently. Annelids have segmentation, arthropods and chordates, so those here in slightly darker shade are the ones that have segmentation. We all know annelids are segmented worms, so they have this very clear repetitive pattern where they each segment have pretty much the same anatomy as the other segments. So it's a very easy way to make the animal grow larger without having to invent a new organization of structures. Arthropods are also segmented, but what's happening in arthropods is many of those segments then become compacted and uh, fused together. In arthropods, like insects, have fused into just three regions, the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen region. Chordates, like us, surprisingly, actually not surprisingly, we're also segmented. You can see our traces of segmentation in, for example, our vertebral columns. We can see that it's a very repetitive pattern. Every um, segment of our vertebrae, it's very similar to the previous one. You can also see our ribs have pretty much a, 
a segmented pattern where every rib is very similar to the other ribs. So what's interesting here is if you see the segmented organisms, annelids, arthropods, and chordates, they do not share a recent common ancestor that had segmentation. Actually, their closest relatives were not segmented. So this means that segmentation appeared individually in each one of these groups. This is important because initially, before we had molecular techniques, we used to use anatomical features to figure out phylogenetic relationships. And segmentation was one of those features that was used to classify organisms together. So we used to think that annelids and arthropods were closely related. And then when we looked and looked at the molecular data, the DNA sequences, we found that they're not that related. Similar story with the presence of coelom. So we used to use the presence of a pseudocelom or the lack of a coelom as a phylogenetic characteristic. And now we know that pseudocelums actually appear multiple times independently. So the same thing with true coelums. There are two different types of coelums. The protosomes have coelom form in one way and the deuterosomes in another way. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind when you're doing your phylogenies and looking at what traits evolve where, which ones are shared are because of shared common descent or which ones are because evolved independently, like in the case of segmentation and pseudocelums.